what is economics? I'm going to start with quite a big picture view, trying to understand what economics as a whole is about, and how academic economics fits into the general structure of the humanities, how it affects policy making, and how the discipline is structured internally. This might seem less approachable than starting with a simple model, or better yet an anecdote, as so many textbooks and popular science books love to do, but I hope it will serve as a more solid foundation and future reference when looking more closely at economic ideas later on. Defining economics is tricky because it is a very broad discipline with many different schools of thought, which focus on different areas. Further, some mainstream economists have analyzed an eclectic array of social activities using traditional mainstream economic tools, such as rational choice and utility maximization. Here's my definition. Economics is the study of how resources are used, how production is organized, how services and consumer goods are distributed to meet needs and wants, and how capital goods and financial capital are accumulated and reinvested. Importantly, it is not about studying how resources are distributed and used in a more logistic sort of way. Instead, in economics, we are interested in systems where multiple people are making separate decisions and interacting with each other, rather than one person or committee making a unified decision about how to organize resources. The language of power. In narrow definitions, Economics can focus only on firms, markets, states, and international institutions. Discourse around this narrow definition of the economy tends to have major policy influence, with discussions about how to increase growth, maintain stable inflation and government debt, and reduce unemployment, occupying a central role in influencing policies, often at the expense of a more immediate focus on providing for people's basic needs. This is often presented as an inevitable choice, with temporary reductions in social provisioning presented as the only, or at least the best, way to provide for long-term improvements in quality of life. There are a number of reasons for this. Corporate interests can form well-organized and funded lobby groups, and capital flight and other forms of capital strike can also be used as threats to discourage more progressive policy. International institutions often have considerable sway over domestic policy through controlling conditions of access to government credit and international trade. But further than this, many people's livelihoods depend directly on these systems of production, even if in an exploitative and inequitable way. Overall, it can be very important to understand the various political motivations behind policy and to understand the true available policy rules. Otherwise, one risks accepting false limits. This is not to say that there are never situations where difficult decisions have to be made with scarce resources, but rather that these limits are often exaggerated. Let a hundred flowers bloom, but root out the weeds. Warring pluralisms in economics. There is a wide collection of different schools of thought in economics, but some of them have much more prestige within the discipline and effects on policy. The largest school of thought is neoclassical economics. At least 90% of the ideas one's going to hear about in policy discussions is going to come from this perspective. This approach begins with the unified, rational and autonomous individual, and then uses the theoretical model of the individual to derive models of society. This is paired with an understanding of markets as relatively stable and harmonious institutions, and even dynamics, such as growth, are treated as relatively smooth and unchaotic activities. This is often, though not always, tied with advocacy for pro-market policies, such as privatization and deregulation. While critiques of these policies can be formulated in neoclassical terms, it narrows the scope of respectable methodologies and underlying assumptions, and discredits a lot of valuable contributions made outside these and not expressed in the advanced mathematical way acceptable by neoclassical economists. Whether one decides to go with a more radical argument from outside of neoclassical economics or a more reformist argument from within neoclassical economics often comes down to strategic choice and understanding what audience one is trying to persuade. 
Many of the key assumptions and methods of neoclassical economics have been challenged in the past by a number of heterodox schools of thought, such as Marxist, post-Keynesian, old institutional, feminist and ecological economics. And even some alternative schools of thought which share neoclassical economics enthusiasm for markets are deeply critical of some of the underlying methodologies, such as Austrian and Schumpeterian economics. But mainstream economics has remained critical and dismissive towards these alternative approaches. However, that does not mean that neoclassical economics has stuck rigidly to its core assumptions. Rather, it has branched out into a number of schools of thought, which each break one or two of its common assumptions, and often bring its methodologies into new areas not typically studied by the school. These include information economics, game theory, and new institutional economics. Many of these schools of thought extend economic analysis to new areas, which we will discuss in the next section. The Economics of Everything, Interdisciplinarity or Economic Imperialism Broader definitions of the economy can include households and community production and distribution through commons as well as quote-unquote ecosystem services. These are undervalued or even entirely overlooked by most economic analysis. However, work within the household such as care work is vital to producing a productive workforce and all economic activity is reliant on environmental factors. In broader definitions, the boundary of what rules and norms and institutions are economic is blurred. A lot of economic activity can be understood through other types of social sciences, while a lot of social activity can be revealed to have economic underpinnings. For example, one can ask the question, to what extent social constructs of race and gender fulfill an economic purpose, allowing for exploitation and division of labour. Even if this should be discussed economically, the question of how this should be done is important. Neoclassical adjacent schools tend to do this by extending its methodologies of rational individualism, without consulting much of the existing literature in the field from other social sciences. Further, it often does not then incorporate these factors back into its models of the main economy. Heterodox approaches tend to focus more on how these societal factors influence the wider economy and play a significant role in capitalist systems of production and accumulation. In conclusion, understanding things economically can be very useful. It can reveal structures and motivations within society, particularly in bargaining which happens within mutually beneficial relationships. And it can often be useful in understanding how these power structures are produced and reproduced, often in complex ways at a national or even international scale. Understanding these can help us understand how to mobilize resources to help those facing social and economic injustice. However, there are also downsides to overextending economic analysis, particularly very simple forms of economic analysis. One example, by assigning an economic value or price to everything, we can get a false sense that things we assign the same price to are equatable. For example, the economic concept of weak sustainability assumes that an increase in capital equipment can make up for depleted natural resources and damaged ecosystems, a clearly dangerous idea. Another danger of economism is that it can remove focus from non-economic forms of oppression and discrimination.